It's a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all back. You heard some of these beautiful lectures earlier in the week. And uh, this is the last uh, in this uh, series of both lectures uh, by Christina Marchetti. And today she's going to be telling us about biological tissues and materials. And um, uh, we would once again request that if you can uh, repeat the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, yes, uh, I've been referring to myself to do the talk, but please try to remember to ask me, Peter, <laughs> because I always forget. So um, thank you. And uh, so today is going to be a little bit different. In fact, uh, uh, there won't be a whole lot of activity, even though I'm talking about tissue, as you as you will see. So um, what I'll be talking about are property of the epithelial tissues. Uh, epithelial uh, tissues are uh, layers of cells uh, that sort of line all the cavities and organs in uh, our bodies. And so they um, provide uh, uh, sort of barriers to protect uh, our organs and therefore have to be able to uh, repair themselves and respond to mechanical forces and to other perturbations as well. And the two images that you see here are sort of two steps uh, in what's called the wound healing assay, tissue that is uh, uh, advancing to healing the wound, which is the empty space of the bed. And uh, um, more generally, uh, the, um, is, uh, there are many uh, developmental processes where uh, uh, transmission of mechanical forces are really uh, very important. So the wound healing, I just mentioned, and that actually is an example, which is, which is a video. Um, and of course, not just mechanical forces transmission, of course, there is also a lot of biochemical signaling and the two kind of feedback to each other. But today I'll be focusing more on the, I'm trying to understand how cell transmit mechanical forces to regulate the uh, mechanical behavior of the tissue as mechanical behavior at the tissue scale. Um, so the other example I'm giving here is uh, a bionic development. Uh, the video that you see to the right uh, is uh, uh, an embryo of a fruit fly that is being imaged during the early stages of development. And uh, that was, uh, okay, I thought it was supposed to be looked, but it's not. It's a video from the of the Baptist Tritum and UCSB. And uh, um, it also um, metastatic invasion, especially collective metastatic invasion, is another example in which uh, um, we now believe mechanical forces play an important role. And in general, of course, how a tissue or material transmit forces. Is your mic on? Yes. Okay. How a tissue or material <clears throat> transmit forces. Uh, really depends uh, on uh, the rheological state of the tissue. That is, is the material a liquid or a solid? Liquid or solid clearly transmit forces in a very different way. And so, uh, one question we're going to be asking is whether tissue behave, when do they behave like liquids, when do they behave like solids? Now, um, there has been a lot of work over the last 10, maybe 15 years um, demonstrating that tissues actually, is, and by, when I talk about tissues, I have in mind uh, two dimensional layers of tissue that often this kind of epithelial, epithelial tissues. Tissues are capable of tuning themselves into sort of transitions from liquid light to solid light state, even in situations when the tissue Issue is confluent. Confluent means, sorry, okay, so, uh, confluent means that there are no gaps between the cells. The cells the cell completely, cover, completely cover the plane, as in these uh, two examples of tissues that you see that you see over here. Now, in uh, regular materials, we often think of tissue becoming solid by increasing the density, but these are examples where the should become solid, then the density is not changing. The top uh, are uh, images of uh, bronchial cells from uh, um, the lab, actually, of Jeff Fredman here uh, at Harvard some years ago. And what is uh, the, the, it's not really very convincing, uh, perhaps, but with the video it's kind of showing, is that uh, um, as the time goes on from day three, day six to day 10, you see that here you see quite a big proportion of the cells, so it's more like fluid like, a lot of rearrangements, fewer rearrangements, and here eventually they're generally stopped. 
Okay, and they actually counted the cells here, but there's really no proliferation, no change in the number of cells. The density is not changing. The bottom is a video from the lab of Giorgio Schitta at the University of Milano, where, and I will run the video in a minute, but what you have here, you'll see when I run the video, that to the left, again, the tissue is pretty much jammed. You will not see a lot of uh, rearrangement of the cells over here. And then what they do is that they overexpress the protein called RAD5A, which apparently is associated with endocytosis. And when they do that, this tissue sort of starts exhibiting these really large scale flows. So again, it's a, it's a tissue that the ability is sort of to define itself. Well, here it's, there's actually a perturbation being done to the tissue, but again, it's a fluidification that happens without the change in the test. So, so I mean, another question. Endocytosis is the popping of cells? It's the popping of a, 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 it's like apoptosis? No, no, it's when the cell either uh, takes in, uh, so it's uh, in, in, takes oh, in so it's, an inclusion or, or it out. It takes in the external yeah. body. So it, it makes the cell edges probably more floppy and more, uh, but it's not really understood exactly what's happening here, although there is actually uh, some. Well, I don't want to spend a lot of time, but uh, uh, there is some evidence that what's actually happening is that uh, these cells, for measurements of mean square displacement, the cell dynamics becomes much more persistent in the sense that I mentioned on, on Monday, I guess. And it's not the persistence of the dynamics can actually fluidify uh, the system. So there is some evidence that that's what happens. Yes. Thank you. But in general, I just want to give this as an example of this ability of tissue to sort of tune themselves uh, between liquids and solid state and constant depth. And there has been also studied in vivo, actually. This uh, is uh, uh, the, uh, in, uh, so this is our uh, uh, work by Oshay Campas when he was at UCSD. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of you know him, he used to be here as a postdoc uh, some time ago. And he's looking at the development uh, of the zebrafish embryo. Uh, and uh, what he was able to demonstrate uh, is that uh, as the tail elongates here, uh, the tissue really fluidifies. It's going to sort of solid like up here and becomes fluid like down here. And remarkably, he was able to demonstrate this, but actually measuring the yield models of the tissue. So the yield modulus uh, is uh, essentially uh, the stress you have applied with yeah, to a solid like material so that it will start flowing. It's the maximum stress the material can sustain. And the way he did this is by actually putting droplets of ferrofluid material inside the tissue, deforming them with a the magnetic field, and from the deformation, inferring actually the so it's quite quite remarkable experiments. But the, the whole point again I want to make is that there's also fluidification that happens in vivo, and it may be a mechanism for uh, driving morphogenetic. Uh, processes. And then finally, so these are uh, tissue that deform themselves. These are internally generated forces, but also people have been interested in asking, well, what happens if we apply external deformation tissue? And people have been, this is Beth Pruitt at UCSB. She's been shearing tissues and showing how the response to shear can be highly collective. And these are all the actually experiments where the tissue is actually stretched and shown to undergo both an elastic type response and then eventually plastic behavior and, and eventually failure. So there's a lot of interest in understanding how a tissue responds to, to mechanical forces and can we actually formulate the constitutive equation for, for this, this, kind, this kind of materials. So with that kind of little bit of motivation, uh, and, and generally the belief is that perhaps you should really think of tissue as material near a solid liquid transition, because they, you know, a material near, near a transition, near a critical point, let's say, can easily tune itself between one state of, or, or the other. And so some of the work we've been doing, uh, as the, our goal has been to try I mean, ideally, you would like to relate molecular processes to cell behavior than to tissue scale behavior. We haven't quite gone that far. We are trying to understand the relation between cell scale properties and tissue scale behavior and formulate sort of effective theory for the material. Again, to understand uh, uh, the, the liquid-like solid behavior and try to formulate uh, the mechanical laws, again, the constitutive equations. And um, in uh, 
in general, for a material, uh, you might think that it can, you know, you can go from solid to liquid to change in, say, density of temperature. In these kind of systems, well, you can actually, tissue do actually solidify by cell division, that is by increasing the density and crowding, even though I didn't show you that. But uh, um, they can also undergo solid liquid transition through a bunch of different processes. Uh, active processes, cell motility can actually others, the, material, the property also may depend on interaction with the environment. But today, I will actually focus on geometry, on the role of geometry and topology of the cellular edge network and associated geometric constraint in determining the solid liquid property of the material and their, and their rheology. So that's why I said really not much activity in today's talk. Okay. And we'll do this in the context of a well-established model, uh, which is known as the vertex model, which uh, is a, an effective, so of course, a tissue layer, the cells are really 3D, uh, but this is an effective 2D model that essentially captures the interplay between um, ad adherence protein that control cell-cell interaction, which are imaged here in red in this image of cells over here, uh, so these uh, cell, cell interaction tend, if you like, to stretch the cell and to increase their uh, um, edge length. And uh, uh, in competition with that, uh, there is the fact that cells tend to be contractile. That is, uh, uh, the cell membrane, just, in, just inside the cell membrane, there is something called the contractile atomizing cortex, which is made of actin and myosin. And you can kind of think of it almost like a rubber band that tends to, to, to shrink the cell. But in addition, uh, the, the cytoskeleton, which is again made of actin and various bio, uh, biological filaments and actin motor protein, um, it's also spent the entire bulk of the cell. And so there is also bulk elasticity from the cytoskeleton. So essentially, uh, the, the model. Uh, maps the cell to 2D and takes into account uh, these two pieces of, uh, of physics or mechanics here. And it's based uh, on an energy. So each cell is really described. So first of all, the cells being confluent, it means that you, and oh, what do I wanted to do? I don't know. Okay, I want to go back here. So you see these cells kind of look like, well, these are a, a little bit uh, irregular, but often they look like sort of like irregular polygons. So you have a tesseling of the plane of irregular polygons. And so the model is based on an energy that says each cell is a polygon, an irregular polygon described by an area and perimeter. And the tissue energy is written in term of this degree of freedom, area and perimeter. So there is a term where uh, uh, that describes an energy cost for deviation of the area from a target value. Tissues are often approximately incompressible in 3D, but once you go to 2D, of course, the cell can change their area by changing their height, and so there is an energy cost to that. And then we have terms that describe uh, this contract contractility, the elasticity of the cells, both of the uh, cell perimeter, well, the PI is the perimeter, and of the sort of the cortex elasticity of the bulk. And in particular here, this gamma is clearly a, an interfacial tension or cell edge tension. And it's chosen here to be negative uh, because actually that's the regime of parameters in which this model seems to describe the property of the tissue and, and uh, uh, has an interesting behavior. Now, in principle, with gamma being negative uh, would mean that the cortical tension, this rubber band that tends to shrink the cell, uh, tends to, uh, to win over the um, uh, effects cell cell adhesion that tends to elongate the cell edges. But I will come back to that. And the argument that I'm going to make is that really this has more to do with geometry that, than with really cell cell adhesion. Now, you can complete the square and rewrite this two term also as a quadratic term. And doing so, you define what we call a preferred perimeter. So essentially what you end up with is that the system where the cell will like to adjust their area to a target value A0 and their perimeter to a target value P0 uh, with some energy cost, uh, cost determined by these two stiffness parameters. 
Now you can answer. Sorry, Christina, sorry, can I ask another question? Yep. Uh, the cortex elasticity term, it's quadratic in the, in the perimeter with a positive coefficient. Yes, evidently. And when you say it comes from the cortex, that means it comes from all these uh, polymers just inside the cell yes. wall, yes. which are trying, they're, they're also trying to make the perimeter small, but why would they do it in a, in a quadratic as opposed to a linear way? Well, so a linear way would change, you know, I have a, I have the linear term here, and then yes. you can say I can change the sign of this term. If this term was positive, I could okay. probably throw away this term. Okay. Okay. But in general, my tension can be a function uh, of I the see. perimeter. So this stabilizes. And you can things. imagine that this is the next term I need in the expansion to stabilize the system. If I, I see. Have. So in another way, I have a tension that generally is a nonlinear function of the perimeter. Okay. So there's an anomalous linear term, and then you need this term yes, to stabilize I, it. I need so that. Thank okay. you. So I can uh, use uh, the square root of a naught uh, to make uh, length uh, to addition to make length dimensionless and one of these two elastic constant for the energy. And when I do that, I can rewrite this energy in terms of two dimensionless parameters only, which is uh, one is called the target cell shape. So it's the uh, target perimeter divided by square root of target area. And I'm actually, there's really another area, which will be the mean area of the cell, which I'm taking equal to A naught, and then the ratio essentially of the stiffnesses. And it's going to be important to keep in mind that, uh, uh, so I, I'm gonna talk about shape, but there'll be two important, two shapes that are really different here. This P naught is really a tuning parameter of the model. That's the target cell shape, the cell shape the cells would like to have. I could also define an observable. This is actually an experimentally measure quant measurable quantity, which is I call the mean cell shape. That is, I, will I could measure the perimeter and the area of each cell, define the shape, average over the entire system, and that would be an observable, okay? And the, it's important to keep in mind the difference between these two quantities. And, and so for the moment, the shells, the, 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 sorry, the cells, if they become elliptical, uh, they all want that, that, that that's disfavored by this model. You couldn't have a nomadic of cells. For example. Uh, there is nothing about alignment in this model. Now the cells could so, but they could, and they do sometimes. Uh, they would have to first of all become yes, like elliptical or elongated in some way. And if you like, uh, so this parameter, if you had a regular polygon, I actually should have put this here, but I put it later. If you had a regular poly okay, a circle, this parameter would be, I think, about 3.54. If you had uh, a pentagon, this parameter is 3.81. If you have an hexagon, it's about 3.72. If you have a square, clearly it's four, okay? So this parameter, in some sense, is a measure of cell, she cell anisotropy, if you like, also. And if the cell is elongated, if you have, instead of a square, a, um, what do you call it? Um, rectangle. A rectangle, right, thank you. A rectangle, this parameter will be bigger than, could be bigger than four, okay? So this is kind of, so the shell, cell will have to get elongated and then they could actually align. And thank you. that can happen, but I don't think I'm really talking about that here today. Okay, so um, so that's the model free energy. And uh, this has been studied. I mean, first of all, this free energy has been studied for a long time by many people. And uh, uh, one of the things that was shown uh, some years ago by Lisa Manning, Max B and, and others, is that this model uh, at zero temperature actually has a transition between a rigid and the uh, liquid-like state tuned by this target shape parameter. And uh, the transition, the rigid state, so the transition occurs at a value about 3.81, which is close to the value for Pentagon of the target shape parameter. For values smaller than that, the cells are sort of round and, uh, and don't uh, uh, exchange neighbors. And so they're solid light, they're jammed. And for values larger than that, uh, the system is liquid like the, the cell actually intercalate, in this case, to in their simulation to T1 transition. And uh, an order parameter, if you like, for the transition is the observed cell shape, which in the solid is locked to the value 3.81 that has in the rigid state. But in the liquid, uh, 
it really uh, grows linearly with the target shape parameter P naught. Okay. Yes. Microphone. Microphone. <laughs> I remember. We make it very sorry. Thank you. Um, can you just elaborate this rigidity transition is a linear rigidity transition that you're thinking about to infinitesimal rotations and translations? Um, uh, it's uh, uh, a rigidity transition in the sense that, so in this, uh, this was uh, um, examining the ground states of the model. What they looked at is the energy uh, in this original work. What they looked at are the um, energy barrier to T1 transition. T1 okay. transitions are, and it's a this energy barrier vanishes ab vanish above 3.8. You can years. also have rotational modes, and this they, is. I don't think one anybody looked at okay. that in this context. Thank okay. You. Okay. But essentially, what I want to tell you is that uh, oh, and and. Uh, Yes, I would just want to see what was my next slide. Um, and actually, this correlate. So the idea here is that uh, cell shape is a metric of tissue fluidity. Okay. And this idea of correlation between cell shape and tissue fluidity has actually been observed in experiments. Uh, these are again the experiments by Jeff Fredberg, where they actually did measure the average uh, uh, cell shape uh, defined the way I define it above. And uh, they were able to and correlate. Uh, so essentially in the uh, solid rigid like state where the cells are now moving around, you see that's the blue case, the cell shape are close to 3.81 and in the liquid they are much more spread out and there are many more that have higher value. And there has been other work actually demonstrating at least, uh, you know, this is biology. So it's, it's not completely quantitative but demonstrating this correlation fairly convincingly. Now, what I want to tell you today is that uh, um, it, it, one way to understand this transition is simply geometry. It's very simple. So these vertex models really are under constraint. Okay, let's think about squares. Make it simple. Forget pentagons and hexagons. So suppose we have a square. So on any polygon of a given the number of sides of area one, if it's a squares that take area one and perimeter four. Now, remember that this, the tissue energy tend, would like to, to get cells to have a fixed area and a fixed perimeter, to adjust their area and perimeter to target value. So let's ask, okay, how many polygons can we make with four sides, area one and perimeter four, if, if we are polygon is a square? Well, clearly only one, there is only this one. But if, it is a quadrilateral that has area one and perimeter bigger than four. Well, then actually there is a family of the form shapes parametrized by this angle theta, which I sometimes call the tilt angle, up to a maximum value that depends on uh, um, the, um, the, that essentially depend. So for every uh, perimeter, so the, these values I mentioned before, for 3.81 for the Pentagon and so on. I actually call the isoperimetric value in the sense that you cannot make a regular, peri regular polygon, you cannot make a regular square with uh, um, a um, isoperimetric value smaller than four, for instance. Okay, but uh, there is a, clearly, if you're thinking about the quadrilateral, so P bigger than four, you actually, there's a family of the form quadrilateral you can make up to a maximum value of theta and they will all satisfy the area and perimeter, the target area and perimeter of the shape energy. So there is a degeneracy here for any P, for any P bigger than four. And uh, you can actually do some very, very, a very simple calculation, which I call a mean field, calculate the mean field ground states of uh, the vertex model. A mean field means that all the polygons are the same. So I'm just taking one polygon. And I'm taking um, the, the case of a square because it's, uh, it's a simpler. So the isoperimetric, I should have called P iso this, the isoperimetric value is four. Uh, and I uh, parameterize the um, vertex energy in terms of the side of the square and this angle gamma. So I rewrite area and perimeter in terms of this quantity. 
And then I determine the ground state by minimizing with respect to these three quantities. And you see immediately why I say that the energy is under constraint, that the model is under constraint because uh, the model tries to fix area and perimeter, but the polygon is determined by three quantities, essentially. So clearly I can, I can solve this uh, ground state problem. And what I find that if P naught, if the target, and these are all, the area is always chosen here um, in, in units of the target area. So if this P naught is bigger than four, uh, then the system is compatible. The system can uh, satisfy both target area and target perimeter. In fact, I have a family of states that satisfy target area and target perimeter. They all have zero energy. They're all ground state of the system. And up to some maximum value of this tilt angle that actually depends on P naught, depends on the value of the, the target perimeter. And uh, if P naught on the other has is less than four, uh, the system is incompatible. I cannot satisfy target area and target perimeter. I actually have a single solution, which is a square outside the determined by this cubic equation that I could determine, could solve. And the ground state energy is finite. So this state is actually as, is gapped or pre-stressed, if you like. And so I could say that in this mean field sense, I actually have a transition between uh, uh, a compatible state where the system can actually adjust. So if I imagine now thinking of this gamma as applying a shear, the system can really adjust to the shear at zero energy cost. So it's a liquid, it's a set, set of the general ground state. And I have the solid here, which is the incompatible state. And so in this sense, you can really think of this rigidity transition as driven by geometric incompatibility. And here is kind of like a phase diagram for the square for which the transition will occur at uh, the isoperimetric value P naught star equal to four. And the liquid again is the compatible regime and the solid is the incompatible regime. It turns out you can actually imagine going to negative P naughts and then there are instabilities. And the um, energy of the liquid has these uh, um, manifold of, ground, of zero energy states and the energy of the solid is uh, is gapped. Yeah. Quick question. What is R? What is R? R was the ratio of, oh, sorry. I changed the notation and I didn't change is R. It, is it R is one over kappa A. <laughs> and kappa A is the ratio of uh, the area to perimeter elasticity. Okay. Wow, that's a keen eye. <laughs> yes. Well, that's okay. I repeat the question I'll remember. <laughs> <laughs> you know, why don't you leave him the microphone? Suraj has one here. The assumption um, of having a finite gamma over which you have an entire degeneracy is effectively saying that there is no shear modulus for the individual. Right. You can actually calculate the shear modulus, and the shear modulus in the solid is linear with P naught, goes to zero, in the liquid is zero. That's why we call okay. this a liquid. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Okay. So and this is just uh, this is actually uh, something we did with Michael Moshes a little while back, and uh, uh, so you can understand essentially this liquid solid transition as this sort of driven by geometric incompatibility. Um, now, of course, uh, real tissue are not made of regular polygons, and uh, so just to summarize, so in this mean field sense for an order vertex model, you would say that you have a transition that occurs at the isoperimetric value, which depends on the particular polygon you choose. And again, the rigid state, if I plot actually the observed cell shape, the rigid or incompatible state will have its uh, observed perimeter or cell shape, in this case, my area is one, so they are the same quantity. The observed perimeter locked to the value of P naught star, and in the liquid, it grows with the target shape P naught. Um, now, in simulations of these order vertex models, generally what you find is the distribution of polygonal shapes, so mostly pentagons, hexagons, and heptagons. And uh, therefore, uh, there'll be sort of a distribution of values at which the cell adjusts their perimeter and get out of the rigid state. And uh, the ones that has the longest perimeter, so the last one to fluidify, will be 
uh, the, uh, and achieve the target value will be the Pentagon. And that's probably why you find that the transition in this dissolver system is very close to the Pentagon value 3.81, actually 3.813. Christina, there, there's a theorem, I'm sure you know, that the average uh, number of sides is six. So so in, in, in any planar yeah. oscillation. Yeah. So doesn't that constrain things somehow that if you start having a mixture of five, sixes, and seven? I think it does constrain yeah. uh, the, the numbers, but I don't know the details. Yes, I, yes, I think you're absolutely. In fact, when, you, when they do simulations, at the beginning, you actually even have triangles and so on, but then, you know, eventually you get to a state where it's mostly five, six, and seven and some. Yeah, and here, I don't know, I just chopped off a little piece. I don't know if I, <laughs> that reflects the constraint. Okay, so um, now, of course, in a, by the way, in, in a real tissue, in addition to these, you will have topological rearrangements like these T1 transitions and cell intercalation, which provide an additional mechanism for fluidification. But this geometrical aspect, I think, can underlie, uh, be there underlying the behavior. And so um, next thing I want to tell you is how this impacts and allows us to understand uh, the response of the tissue to external deformations. And these are actually simulations done by Max B, uh, Northeastern, and his student, Jun uh, Jiang Wang. Uh, that we actually published uh, relatively recently. So what uh, Max and Junjiang did is to apply a quasi-static uh, shear to this vertex model of the tissue. So they essentially, so the shear rate, now gamma dot is my shear rate now. Essentially gamma dot is going to zero and means they let the system equilibrate, they shear the vertex model. Uh, they use essentially a Lise Edwards type boundary condition and they calculate the stress and they look at the stress as a function of, uh, well, here as a function of time or as a function of uh, uh, applied strain. Now the stress is calculated, so this is shear stress. In general, the forces in this model are both tensions along cell edges and cellular pressure that you can actually calculate from the tissue energy. Uh, but uh, the stress uh, um, that is determined uh, as a response to a, a, a shear involves only the tensions and can be calculated by this uh, sort of virial type formula. So T are the tension along the edge joining vertices I and J, and L and L I J is the length of the of the of the edge. So, Christina, in a conventional solid, there would be peach color forces tending to rip dislocations apart, edge dislocations, uh, if this were some regular crystalline solid. It's not crystalline enough to... Well, uh, so I that, think or? I think this might have something to do with these jumps, because these jumps are a sort of plastic events. They're yeah, slippages. Exactly, exactly. So I think uh, that corresponds... You know, people haven't looked at these in terms necessarily of these locations, though you could. You could think as... I was talking to Grace today, we has been looking at uh, T1 transitions as uh, in terms of these locations, but that's what's happening here. So in fact, the response, so here are now plots of stress versus strain. And uh, in the solid, so this is P0, remember the transition here, um, it's about 3.81. So here you are in the solid. What you find is uh, uh, nonlinear elasticity first, but then also this sort of intermittent plasticity, as it's called, because there are these uh, uh, plastic slips continuously in the response. In the fluid, uh, there is a region of strain where uh, you measure no stress because this is a fluid and it's flowing. And then eventually, though, above when you go above a certain strain, the uh, fluid stiffens, the strain stiffens. And the response sort of like a solid, although the difference is that when it slips plastically, here it just doesn't go, remains pre-stressed, and here it goes down to zero. Okay, yeah. Is this uh, quasi-static? Yes, this is quasi-static. The question was, is this quasi-static? And the answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. Oh, and I just wanted to show again the strain stiffening of the fluid tissue. So now again, these are stress versus strain uh, on a different scale. So the blue curve is a, is a solid. It starts stiffening again. It's only linear in a very small region over here, but the fluid uh, 
you know, you have to strain it enough to get it to stiffen. And in fact, you can actually measure the critical strain at which it stiffens as a function of P naught and is plotted here. So you could say that uh, uh, this critical strain um, defines a transition from a fluid to a solid. Uh, it's a little bit of a different solid from the solid over here because this is the strain stiff and solid, but there is this, uh, this transition. Now, I want to argue that we can understand that again with our uh, simple mean field model. I go back to my mean field model again for a square because I can only I only have the stamina of doing calculations for squares in this context and not for other polygons. Now, my what I call before a tilt angle, I can now think of it as an externally applied strain to my polygons. And I can actually use my uh, ground state calculations to actually calculate the perimeter. I didn't write down the perimeter before, but I can calculate it. And uh, uh, what I will find is that uh, here is the perimeter as a function of strain for different values of P naught, which is increasing this way. I don't know why I didn't, I should have put an arrow and it doesn't show that. So each color is a different value of P naught and is increasing and we go up. And uh, in uh, the liquid, which occurs for gamma, and I calculate the gamma C of P naught, which I found that has this quadratic dependence uh, away from the transition point. So in the liquid P is equal to P naught, that's the horizontal portions over here. And then when the system strain stiffens, uh, P, P actually is increased compared to the value in the unstrained solid. And the first correction is of order gamma square, is the strain of the square. And these are actually the value of the uh, observed cell shape, which corresponds to the perimeter in, in the mean field model where A is one. Um, Again, uh, for uh, increasing values of P naught, as you go from the solid, which would be sort of this red curve into the liquid. And as you can see, there is a very close agreement. And here is uh, um, the strain, the stress versus strain. Now here actually I'm plotting um, the stress, not versus the actual um, applied uh, strain, quasi-static applied strain, but uh, in terms of uh, what's sometimes called the true strain in mechanics, which is sort of the strain you would have to apply to get a global deformation of the system uh, to go uniformly from the initial state to the final state. And it's defined as the log of the ratio of the um, eigenvalues of shape tensor. And anyway, so it's a, it's a quantity that sort of averages out of the plastic slips, essentially, this becomes. So again, I can understand this kind of uh, strain stiffening uh, simply in terms of my, uh, my mean field model. And furthermore, if I go back to the measured uh, gamma C of P naught, very close to the transition, maybe you can believe that a, 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 a one F exponent kind of, kind of fits the behavior. And by the way, there has been actually um, experiments uh, in uh, um, looking um, at uh, the behavior of cell shape uh, and cell shape elongation in fruit fly, uh, correlating the observed cell shape with, in this case, was the alignment of cell shape driven by internal stresses. And uh, again, seeing this kind of uh, uh, similar type of uh, uh, dependence, that meaning this quantity grows like u square, just like here, the observed cell shape goes like the square of the of the strain. Okay, now uh, where am I? I thirteen. Okay, um, you can also do more with this. Uh, you can actually. Uh, plot, so you, you can think of the deviation of this observed cell shape from uh, uh, the P naught star as sort of an order parameter. You can plot all this observed cell shape, uh, various values of P naught, and uh, based on the results of the mean field model, you can kind of guess a critical scaling and you find, that you find these curves. Uh, there is actually a very good scaling with exponents that really corresponds to the exponents you can calculate from, uh, from a mean field theory, um, where, uh, um, so suggesting that perhaps there is some universality in all of these, this, kind of, this kind of transition and this kind of behavior. Now, let me see, I wanna see how much time I have. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Microphone. 
So the in the beginning, at least in the um, original vertex model calculation, which you showed as well, the max did where they measured the trans, um, barrier to T1s yeah. and, and that vanished at the uh, transition. That is not there in the mean field model. No, because that, the mean field model is not, not. But at the same time, you're saying that if you now focus all the deformation as being just a fine on individual cells, then you can still get capture the scaling collapse of the order parameter. Do you uh, know how to relate the two? Like, why is how do you end up getting mean field exponents even from these different? I think it's because uh, so um, Max looked. I don't have it here, but they uh, he looked quite in some detail of uh, uh, how much uh, non-affine deformations the system has here, and uh, they seem to only you, you only have substantial fine non-affine deformation near the transition. But as soon as you are away, the system seems to respond in a very affine way. So, which clearly non-affine deformation are not in the mean field model. So. I don't know that I have a precisely an answer, but uh, they these but, but at the transition. I would, would yeah, not at the transition, that. it seems uh, so. Yeah, I'm not sure. So I'm supposed to say that's a good question since I don't know the answer. <laughs> um, okay, so and it's useful actually to reformulate the mean field model now. In, in uh, so I, I gave you a very simplistic. Uh, description of my mean field model, I'm going to reformulate it a little bit more generally in terms of the deformation tensor. So deformation tensor will describe, and I'm, as I said, I only have a fine deformations here. Uh, deformation tensor uh, will, uh, so say, if I have vert vertex at position Rj and I deform the system, I get R prime and uh, the deformation tensor relates the undeformed and deformed uh, uh, vertex positions. So I'm only looking at situations where I have a shear, area preserving shear in two dimensions. And so I can write the deformation tensor. We will have to have uh, a, um, a determinant of one. And so I only have two independent quantities, the dxy, which is sort of like my tilt angle, my strain angle. And the other two are related this way because the area, I'm choosing the area to, to be one, is the area doesn't change, it's an area preserving deformation. So um, I can uh, rewrite, I go back. I'm actually uh, only considering changes in perimeter. The area is fixed to one. And I can actually go back to my vertex model and uh, uh, write the deform. I start with a regular polygon. I deform it with this deformation. I write the perimeter in terms of the two elements of the deformation tensor. And this is kind of equivalent, essentially, to what I told you before, only now is done for hexagons. So for each uh, value of P naught bigger than the isoperimetric value that for hexagons is actually 3.722, I will find the family of the four polygons that satisfy area one and perimeter equal to P naught for every P naught bigger than that value. And, and these are plotted here in the plane of dxy and dxy minus one. These are these contours. Uh, these are the isoperimetric contours, if you like. And clearly, this is just another way of saying what I said before. There is a maximum dxy, which I, which are my like gamma c, that can uh, sustain this deformation, and that's the critical value over here. Now, why am I uh, doing this? I'm repeating this is because it is actually then convenient to uh, rewrite uh, the vertex model free energy. And again, this is just the perimeter formulation in terms of uh, um, so I will actually, given these contours are kind of elliptical here, I'm going to rewrite uh, the, so remember I, sorry. Okay, I take the vertex model, uh, the perimeter contribution, I deform, I rewrite the perimeter in terms of dxs and dxy, and then I actually parameterize the xx and the xy in terms of this uh, scalar quantity m, which is sort of an order parameter, and the cosine of an angle. I write it in polar coordinates. And when I do that and I expand up to order m to the fourth, I obtain a 5 4 type free energy with uh, a coefficient of the quadratic term that changes sign at p naught star. And so this free energy really. Uh, as, as a transition, 
uh, for t bigger than zero, the free energy has a single minimum, which actually should not be at zero. Well, yeah, I dropped the, the constant term. So as a, um, as a single minimum, and that's the solid. And for t less than zero, the free energy has this kind of uh, uh, Mexican hat form, but it's not a full Mexican hat. It's just a section of a Mexican hat because uh, the Goldstone mode, which is uh, changes in the angle theta, uh, eventually uh, breaks down above a characteristic theta maximum where the liquid strain stiffens. And so uh, this is a, a kind of an interesting 5-4 theory where you have this uh, kind of unusual feature. You have your massive modes corresponding to fluctuation in the magnitude of the other parameter. You have this Goldstone mode but it's not uh, it's an anisotropic kind of structure here can you say again the physical meaning of the parameter theta is the distortion of one of the is the distortion of your it, it, the parameter theta parameterizes again the distortion of the polygons and that's assumed in this mean field theory to be a constant uh it's not bearing in space or yes oh yes a constant in space this is this mean field theory is just one polygon <laughs> okay so it's really very simple minded and so the idea is that the mean field theory, all the polygons are the same, so you can only treat, you can treat only one. And this is uh, the, the actual coefficients, like three-fifths, correspond to a four-sided polygon. No, this is actually for uh, hexagon, I believe. Hexagon. This is, we had, Max uh, calculated this for okay. hexagon. I, I only did it for squares, but he did it for hexagons. Okay, and alpha or, uh, and beta depend on some non-trivial and alpha and beta yeah. depend on p naught and contain uh, numerical factors that depend on which polygon you are you are considering yes thank you yeah okay and uh um let's see what else do i want to say because i wanted to get to something mm, okay and you can even use the mean field theory to actually explain the nonlinear behavior of uh, uh, the shear boundary loss in the solid, and sort of uh, uh, you find that uh, in the solid, the nonlinear uh, stiffening, uh, the, the nonlinear behavior of the stress versus strain in the solid has this form, uh, which actually is found uh, to fit well the simulations. But I would like to, uh, so. I want to ignore these a minute because I want to let to get to another thing that I would like to. This is kind of somewhat preliminary, and I would like to, to run it by you. But first, let me just summarize quickly these quasi-static results. So, uh, strain rigidifies the liquid tissue above a critical strain, and this is actually a rather general property, I think, of all under-constrained material. And we have this phase diagram in the strain target shape uh, uh, plane. Um, we find that above a critical stress, uh, uh, the solid solid exhibits nonlinear elasticity, and I really don't talk about that. But I would say the main point I'm trying to make is that this mean field model, I think, offers a simple explanation of tissue mechanics just in terms of cell geometry, although eventually topological transition will play a role too. Now, what I wanted to get to is, is now this. Now, in collaboration with Suzanne Fielding, who is really an expert in rheology, and just her student, James Cochran, who I guess doesn't like photographs, um, <laughs> we also looked at simulations, a shearing at a finite rate, okay? And if you shear at a finite rate, uh, first of all, the, for a small uh, strain rate, but really, this is really not small enough to be quasi-static, but relatively small strain rate, um, in the, the initial, so it is this plotted the stress, which is now called big sigma, and the perimeter as a function of uh, uh, the strain rate times time. So this is like a strain. Uh, you find the behavior that uh, uh, it's not too different from the ones that from quasi-static simulations. When you shear at a larger strain rate, you find what looks like is perhaps a more boring behavior, but one interesting thing you find is that there is actually a yield stress, a final stress, a zero strain rate in both the solid and the liquid. Here the transition is the purple curve. So above the purple curve is solid, below the cur purple curve is liquid. It doesn't seem too much to be happening here. 
Although I think actually these, uh, the lowest curve for the liquid is really still in a non-Newtonian regime. If you actually went to even smaller values, I think you would, the yield stress should actually go to zero. But, but one of the things I've been really thinking about for a while is trying actually to model uh, these, uh, to, to write, write down continuum models to describe a sort of the rheology of tissues, including the rheology of finest strain rate. And what we've been trying to do is the following. So I just told you that uh, there is this uh, single cell shape that provides an order parameter for tissue fluidity. Okay, and the single cell shape, you start with the liquid, you strain it, uh, the liquid eventually stiffens and the perimeter goes up quadratically with the strain rate. So in order to formulate a continuum model tissue rheology, I think we need to capture the interplay between the single cell shape that, that tunes the solid liquid transition and uh, the strain and flow at the tissue scale, which can then feed back by changing the shape at the level of the single of the single cell. And so what we've been trying to formulate is uh, a, a model, a continuum model that couples two order parameters or quantities, if you like. One is uh, a shape tensor. So in a, a more general way, rather than perimeter, just perimeter and area of quantifying the shape of a polygon or in general of any object in two dimension, the, here is written for a polygon is the single cell shape tensor, which can be defined, there are other ways, but this is one way of defining it. And of course, um, from the single shell, cell shape tensor, you can actually calculate the area and the perimeter of the polygon. The area is just the square root of the determinant. The perimeter is a bit more complicated than expression. But uh, what we learned from uh, the previous mean field theory is that uh, we can actually describe the transition just by assuming the area to be one and focusing on the perimeter. So I'm going to consider a model where I describe uh, the liquid solid transition in terms of the perimeter at the level of single cells. At the level of, then you can also define a tissue shape tensor by coarse graining the single cell shape over the entire tissue. And this cap capture tissue scale shape changes and deformation. And of course, this could also capture cell alignment of elongated cells, because now uh, the um, you know if uh, if the uh, individual cells have their principal axis oriented in the same way, this will also serve as an order parameter for for the alignment. And so, what we started trying to do is sort of to write down a continuum model that essentially couples these two quantities very phenomenologically. And in terms of uh, a flow velocity of the tissue, this tissue shape tensor and the cell perimeter. And then as you sort of do in polymer, we, do, we haven't actually written, we cross write an equation for the stress, but for now we just say the stress eventually is determined by the tissue scale deformation to uh, through the um, linear shear modulus, which we calculated in mean field theory that is finite in the solid and vanishes in the liquid. And so the equation we write down are the following. For the perimeter, we write an equation where we say, well, the perimeter can be strained, the strain rate can stretch the perimeter and deform it. And then there is a relaxation here that uh, uh, says that uh, the perimeter can acquire, that is supposed to capture the transition and the strain stiffening, because it says that the perimeter can either be equal to P naught in the liquid, or to P naught star at the level of the mean field theory, I had P naught star plus the square of the strain rate. But now what I'm saying is that the perimeter will actually be strained by the effective deformation generated at the scale of the tissue. So I'm kind of, this is kind of the feedback between the deformation at the scale of the tissue and the deformation of the individual uh, perimeters. And the strain stiffening is, is uh, quadratic in SIJ because it can't depend on uh, just flipping the sign of the strain is physically the same. Well, or... there's, it's quadratic for two reasons. It's quadratic because um, in my mean field theory, I found that the strain stiffening went like gamma square where gamma was uh, was the strain. 
is quadratic because, well, by symmetry, <laughs> I, I cannot write it. Uh, in rheology, sometimes people will write the square root of this because they, they need to get away with the, but, I, but since I know that it's quadratic in the strain, I, I, wrote, I wrote it this way. We wrote okay. it that way. And for, oh, sorry. I think you have about three or four minutes. Okay, I will finish in one minute. Uh, and uh, and then for uh, uh, for the tissue scale um, shape uh, tensor, we take inspiration from uh, uh, theory of rheology of dense active suspensions. That essentially now remember uh, the shape tensor here is essentially pro proportional to the stress tensor. So this is like writing an equation for the stress tensor. Uh, that essentially write a Maxwell type viscoelasticity. So the rate of change of the uh, shape tensor, well, of course, is uh, controlled, uh, is couples to flow in, uh, these are actually terms that are sort of dictated by um, kinematics, essentially. And uh, this is like a Maxwell relaxation, this A is a Maxwell relaxation rate, and it's supposed to incorporate stress relaxation now to topological transition and plastic events. And in the context of that suspension, what people do is that they actually call this A the fluidity, the tissue fluidity, and they assign the dynamics to the fluidity itself, which is sort of constructed by hand to uh, assure that uh, you will actually get a finite yield stress in the limit of zero strain rate. And this kind of models have been actually quite successful at modeling the rheology of dense suspensions. Now, what I really would like to do, which we haven't done yet, is to try to see, and maybe Grace has made some progress in this direction, is to try to see if we can understand how to actually um, model the, um, more microscopically, the stress relaxation due to T1 transition and sort of perhaps derive these equations. And this is all done in a sort of a specially homogeneous kind of, kind of state. So again, what's the point here? The point is to say, I want a rheology that will capture the liquid solid transition and that's captured at the level of a single cell shape by this equation, which is inspired by what I learned from the mean field theory. And where I now have the feedback of the deformation that the strain or strain rate will induce at the tissue scale. And in addition, I put in by hand some stress relaxation due to T1 transition. Now, this model uh, captures, of course, the strain stiffening because I put it in. Uh, and uh, it actually reproduces quite well the final strain rate simulations uh, that uh, were done uh, um, in Durham by Suzanne, Suzanne and her students. And so what we are trying to do is really try to generalize this and uh, try to go beyond this really kind of phenom simple phenomenology here. Okay, so um, to summarize, at final strain rate, we find, oh, but I do have one thing for David that I was going to, to because- Of course you have time for that. Uh, yes. <laughs> so all we have done here is essentially zero temperature, right? There, there's no temperature. This is all looking essentially at, at zero temperature, both at quasi-static and final strain rate. And, uh, um, I thought what David um, was going to, and one thing that is missing is certainly the role of cell motility, also special in homogeneities, but in particular cell motility, cell motility introduces almost like a temperature in this problem, produces fluctuations, and you might wonder what happens. And I thought David was gonna ask me, what about the shear viscosity? Doesn't the shear viscosity diverge? <laughs> Well, it does. <laughs> well, so this is actually work of some time ago by my student, Jimbo Young, that just left Harvard to take a job in Dresden. He was a postdoc with Dan Edelman for a while. These were simulations of the vertex model, of the motile vertex model with motility, where we actually calculated that people seem to have forgotten. Even we forgot it, actually. We, he calculated, uh, so he looked at, calculated the effective viscosity to a green cubotide formula. He calculated the stress tensor and calculated the effective viscosity green cubotide formula, but for a motile system. So it's like a system of finite temperature. And what he 
showed is that actually the shear viscosity diverges uh, near the transition, of course, once you include motility is modified, um, a very low motility. Okay, so the 0.5 will be the blue. See, that's the closest to 3.81. The motility shifts the transition to lower values of P0. And so you see this kind of divergence of the apparent viscosity here. And that's certainly something we want to explore some more, but I just put this in for you. So just to make sure I understand, the, this V0 motility parameter is the root mean square velocity of the center of mass of the cells? No, the V0 is, so what we do here is, uh, remember on Monday, I talked about the cell propelled particles. Now we put a cell propulsion on the Voronoi cells. Okay. Cell propulsion with uh, random rotational noise. Okay. And the V0 is the fixed cell propulsion speed of the Voronoi cell, cells. And that's why I'm saying you can it think of it as a <laughs> bit of like a, temp I mean, it's not exactly a temperature, but uh, it's, uh, it's kind of related. So that's why. Okay, and with that, I will stop and maybe I'll just leave this picture up and uh, again, and thank you. So any additional questions? Uh, there are other people that uh, want to speak up. Well, it was really exciting to have you here this week. Thank you. Uh, three beautiful talks. And uh, uh, thank you once again uh, for your visit and your beautiful lectures. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. It's been, it's been really fun. <laughs>